Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's event, Bonding with Your Dog with dog trainer and author, Victoria Sheed. My name is Michelle Leifer and I'm the director of the USAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Animal Medical Center. So the mission of the Institute is to be the go-to place for reliable and up-to-date pet health information. But another important aspect of what we do is celebrate the bond that we have with our companion animals, which is why we're so excited about this event. Um, so tonight's event, like all of our events, will be recorded and we'll send out a link tomorrow. So in case you miss anything or would like to watch it again, um, so Victoria has a wonderful presentation planned with a lot of ground to cover. So we ask that you please save your questions until the end of, end of her presentation. And we will be taking them via chat and try to get to as many of them as possible. So our next event will be dental disease, getting to the root of the problem with Dr. Jordan Ford, the resident doctor in AMC's dentistry service. Um, that event will be held on Wednesday, February 17th at 6 p.m. Um, and a registration link will go out in our newsletter this evening. You can also find information about our upcoming events at amcny.org slash events. Um, and I would also, I'm very happy to announce that my USDAN Institute colleague, Kimberly Young, who does such a fantastic job organizing the events, was recently promoted to education coordinator. So congratulations, Kimberly. Um, and thank you so much for all of your hard work. Um, and well, thank you guys. Hello, yeah. <laughs> um, and now it, it's my pleasure to introduce Victoria Shade. Victoria is a dog trainer and author with more than 20 years of experience working with and writing about dogs. Her how-to books, Bonding with Your Dog and Secrets of a Dog Trainer, help pet parents get the best out of their best friends. And her works of fiction, including Life on the Leash, Who Rescued Who, and the upcoming Lost, Found, and Forever, mix her dog training knowledge with lighthearted romantic comedy fun. Um, Victoria has also worked with Animal Planet for the past 15 years as the lead animal trainer on the, the channel's popular Puppy Bowl special, um, and we'll be sure to ask her about that later. Um, and on a personal note, she shares her life with her husband, Tom, and her adorable dogs, Millie, who's a 10-year-old smooth Brussels Griffon, and Olive, a 9-year-old mixed breed. So we're so thrilled to have her here to lead tonight's event. Um, without further ado, Victoria Shade. Hi, everyone. I am so honored to be with you tonight to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart, which is bonding with your dog. So I'm going to jump right in and attempt technology, guys. Let's see if it works for me. Yay. All right. So let's get started. So everyone is here tonight for different reasons. Um, you might be here because you're frustrated by your dog's behavior. Raise your hand. I mean, hey, I've been there. My dogs are not perfect. Yes, I'm a dog trainer. I don't have perfect dogs. So you might be here because you're frustrated too. You might have a brand new puppy and you wanna set your pup up for success and start off on the right paw. And I'm glad you're here for that. You might have a new to you adult rescue dog and you wanna make sure that you're doing everything you can to, to cement your bond and build a really wonderful relationship with your dog. And you might be one of the lucky people who thinks, yeah, everything's great and awesome. And I just wanna make sure I'm doing everything I can to bring out the best in my best friend. The good news is no matter why you're here, I've got tips and tricks for all of you that will hopefully help you improve your bond with your dog. So what are we gonna to cover tonight? First, I wanna give you a quick overview of what I think the bond is and spoiler alert, it's probably not what you think. We are gonna talk about some bummers. We're gonna talk about some of the ways that we accidentally injure our bond with our dogs. And then most importantly, we're gonna talk about how we can build our bond with our dog. That's where the fun happens. So let's jump right in folks, what is the bond? Now, when I first talk about the bond, people are like, oh yeah, I've got this, my dog loves me. 
Problem is, love and the bond are two different parts of our relationship with our dogs. They're related, but they're not the same. So what is love? This is part of what love is. Love is what makes your dog dance when you get home. Now, love develops naturally. It's through every interaction that you have with your dog. You are, you are deepening the love that you feel for each other. Um, I would venture to say that even in households that maybe, you know, don't have the best relationship, maybe, you know, a household where unfortunately the dog's living outside, I would say that that dog probably still has love and affection for their caregiver, but do they have a bond? No, obviously they don't. So the bond takes time and attention to build, and that's why you're all here tonight. So the bond, this is part of what I think the definition is. It's, it's the glue of your relationship and it's related to training. It's not just training, that's definitely a piece of it. But um, it's like I said, it's what keeps your dog close by. Now I have a great story from a, a fellow trainer. We were talking about what we think the bond is and she was telling me about how she was having furniture delivered to her house and the guy delivering the furniture saw that she had a dog and realized that he'd left the door open. So he turned and ran, ran to the door and said, I just wanna make sure that your dog doesn't you know, escape. And she said, no, he's, he's not gonna go anywhere because he knows that the fun happens with me. And I thought that was a really beautiful way of illustrating the bond that she had with her dog. And I will caveat this and say that this is not the same thing as a dog that sees a squirrel outside the door and takes off running after it. This is the case of the dog that always has an eye on the door and is looking for every opportunity he can to get out. All right, so let's talk about, hey technology, I went right past it. So here's how I define the bond. There are three parts to it. First, mutual respect. Now, emphasis on the word mutual. Back in the day, respect was a one-way street, right? Our dogs had to respect us because we were the alpha. And we've learned, thankfully, how wrong we were about that. But that's not what we're talking about in this talk. Um, I want to talk about the, the mutual respect. So not only should our dogs respect us, but we need to respect our dogs. We need to recognize that they are sentient beings with moods and feelings and that they're not little computers waiting to be programmed. I watched a, uh, a talk by someone who, who worked with seeing eye dogs and he was talking about how wonderful dogs are and they're always happy and they never have a bad day. No. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Our dogs do have feelings and moods and we need to respect that. The second part of the bond is trust. And again, this is a two-way street. We have to trust that when we bring dogs into our home that they're not gonna bite great aunt Martha and they're not gonna rip up the furniture, but they need to trust that we are looking out for their best interests as well, that we are going to be their advocate. And there's a, actually a pretty sad story from my, my training history. I got a call from a gentleman who told me that he was having difficulties leash walking or with his dog when he was, he was running with his dog and his dog just was very difficult. So I expected to just see a you know, typical dog that pulls. But when I got to see this dog in action, I realized that this dog was petrified of the cars going by. So once I'd seen enough, I, I told the gentleman, listen, we're gonna have to do some really slow, careful training to make sure that your dog is feeling comfortable with cars. And until we get to the point where we can recognize that he's okay, you shouldn't go running with your dog you know, next to traffic, maybe go to a park or something. And as I'm talking to him, I can see him like, mm -hmm, yeah, whatever, turns out, he had no desire to do a, a slow and easy approach to getting his dog past this extreme fear that it had. All he cared about was going running with his dog. And unfortunately, we, he didn't want to work with me. So the sad fact is that poor dog could not trust his person to keep him out of harm's way because he put him there every day. 
The final piece of the bond is regard, just a fancy word for the attentiveness that you should have for each other. And by attentiveness, I mean, does your dog check in with you when you're in an unfamiliar environment? Does your dog look up at you when you're going for a leash walk? And we will talk more about that. Huge compliment. When you're walking, are you just a dead weight that's keeping your dog from going forward faster? All of these things play into the bond. All right, let's get to the bummer stuff, folks. And oh, what a sad, sweet puppy that is. So here are some of the ways that we accidentally undermine our bond. Now, there are a few takeaways I want you to have from this talk tonight. This is a big one right here. If you are using any sort of equipment like a choke chain, a prong collar, an e-collar, which is just a fancy word for a shock collar, let's be honest. If you're using any of those tools to train your dog, you are doing damage to your bond. And I recognize that this is legacy equipment, right? This is the way that we used to train dogs, choke chains. I will be the first to admit when I started training 20 years ago, this is the methodology that I was taught. I wasn't comfortable with it, but this is what I was taught. This used to be the only option. Happily, when you know better, you do better. And we have learned so much about the way animals learn. And we have learned that science-based positive reinforcement training is the best way to work with animals. And when I say animals, I don't mean just dogs. I've, I've talked with zookeepers and obviously we've all seen video footage of keepers that have trained everything from devil rays to uh, you know killer whales, ethics aside, of course, to big cats. All of these creatures are being trained without the use of force. And if they can do it, we can do it. And we owe it to our dogs. Before I move on, um, I do wanna talk about terminology. And this is a little aside, words matter. And I think the words that we use when we train our dogs really matter. So. Hopefully you will not catch me using the word obedience during this presentation because obedience sounds like it belongs in like a 1950s Catholic school, right? Do we want an obedient dog or do we want a well-behaved companion? And similarly, cue and the word command. So do we need to command our dogs? Are we in the military or can we just cue or request? So this is just my little plea to really think about the type of words that you use to describe the way you work with your dog. And by the way, my first training business was named Good Dog Obedience. So it, it's a tough habit to get past, but I am working my very hardest. Okay, another way that you can injure your bond with your dog is a lack of exercise. Unfortunately, I don't think we're giving our dogs as much physical and mental exercise. We need to meet those needs in order to, you know, get the type of behavior we're hoping for from our dog. A lot of the behaviors that are written off as, you know, the, the bad behaviors, the barking, the, you know, household destruction, digging in the yard, these are because our dog's physical needs and mental needs aren't being met. So if you're able to you know, give the type of enrichment that your dog needs, you're gonna start to see the type of behavior that you're hoping for. It's, it's a, it's a two-way street. Um, a lot of times people will say, well, how much does a dog need? What sh you know, what's the standard of what I should be giving? I wish there was a standard, a universal standard, but I can pretty much bet that all of our dogs, mine included, can use more than they're getting, especially the mental enrichment. But the good news is I've got some tips for you. So stay tuned. I wish I could see all your faces, by the way. Speaking of faces, can we all just pause and admire this beauty for a moment? I like strange looking dogs. I guess we can call that a dog, right? Isn't he fabulous? So another way that we accidentally damage the bond we have with our dogs is having unrealistic expectations. And what do I mean by that? Lots of different things that we can do, but when it comes to training, there's a big one. The idea that if it's taught once, it's known forever. So let me just give you a scenario. 
let's say you have an adolescent lab and you go for training in the fall and you complete a six week course in a facility and it goes great. Your dog is brilliant, head of the class. You get your diploma, yay, training's done. And then we head into the winter season, it's cold. You're not spending as much time outside. Then spring comes, what do you do? You go to the park with your dog, yay, you're so excited. While you're there, you do a recall, you tell your dog to come. Your dog doesn't come. Suddenly, he's stubborn. He's not listening to me. He's dumb. Unfortunately, that's not the case at all. What's happened is so much time has passed and you probably haven't practiced that you've set your dog up to fail, basically. You're in a new environment that you've never practiced in before. Keep in mind that all the practice you did was probably either around your house or in that training facility. So new environment with lots more distractions. And again, you probably didn't practice as much during that off season. So holding your dog to an unrealistic expectation of, of what his capabilities are can really damage the bond because you end up frustrated and your dog end up, ends up confused. So I think we are flying through this guys. So I mentioned there are some, some takeaways I want you to take from tonight's presentation. And this is a big one, by the way, speaking of frustration, you might hear some um, dog singing upstairs. <laughs> I hear it. So not learning doglish. This is another big takeaway. I hope that you, you take away tonight. Our dogs work so hard to understand us, right? Not only do they learn our language, they learn English. They also learn our body language, all these weird things we do with our bodies. You know, uh, we hug them, we stare at them. They learn it all, but we don't always pay them the same respect. So let's look at this picture. Cute little pug. Is he tired? You know, I think that we, we make assumptions about canine behavior. We think we know what's happening. Sure looks like maybe he's tired or the dog's tail is wagging. He must be happy, right? But if we truly were students of doglish, we would understand that there's always more to it. So in this scenario, this little guy, is he tired or is he stressed? Yawning is one of the, the signals that dogs do when they're feeling uncomfortable or overwhelmed. And in this scenario, this dog, I'm guessing he was probably pretty stressed out. You know, he's, he's probably in a studio standing on that very slippery paper and he's got a photographer right up in his face, more than likely that's a stress yawn. So learning to speak doglish prevents your dog from being in scenarios where he's uncomfortable or pushed beyond his limit or is trying to signal you that he needs your support. And as your dog's advocate, that's, that's one of your primary jobs. Um, when we don't learn what our dog is saying to us, mistakes can happen, misunderstandings can happen, and unfortunately, sometimes tragedy can happen. Years ago, there was a, um, a newscaster who was interviewing a gentleman whose dog had just been rescued from, I think, a, a dam or something. And the dog during the interview was signaling how uncomfortable he was. And granted, it was subtle, but they weren't picking up on the fact that he was uncomfortable. And at the end of the interview, the reporter went in to give the dog a kiss. And what happened? She got bitten on the face. So that's why recognizing, one of the reasons why recognizing what our dogs are saying to us is so important. And of course, it's not always at that level of extreme, but we do want to make sure that we know what they're trying to signal to us. And if we don't, bond breaker, potentially. All right, not allowing choices. And this is, this is kind of a different concept. So this is another little thing that we might do that could injure our bond. And not allowing choices. The ability to control outcomes is important for mental health. And our lives with our dogs, we basically dictate everything. Think about your dog's daily life. So you decide what they eat, when they eat, how much they eat, um, when, when and where they walk, who they meet, where they sleep, 
when they get up, when they go to bed, every single part of their lives are decided by us. So we, it's up to us to find ways to give them the option, to, to give them choices. So what's one example? Interaction with other people and other dogs. So, and a lot of this is gonna go back to speaking doglish. Um, maybe your dog doesn't wanna meet the six kids that just got off the school bus and are running over to him at top speed, or maybe he doesn't wanna hang out at the dog park. It's up to us to allow our dog that choice, or it should be. Uh, hello, technology. Cooperative care. So we all have to do husbandry behaviors with our dogs, um, trimming nails, cleaning out ears. And if your household is anything like mine, sometimes you might have to liberate something from your dog's rear end. Oh, isn't that fun? It can be stressful. It can be very stressful for the dog. And giving your dogs choices during cooperative care, not just training him to accept it, but giving him choices while we, we go through it is really, really helpful. And as an example, my dog, Olive, you'll hear me referring to Olive a lot because she's kind of the squeaky wheel in our household. Um, she, she's having an eye issue right now. So that means I have to give her eye drops three times a day. And it was very sudden, you know, we did not have time to train her to feel comfortable with that. It was just get her home and get the drops in. Now, I did my best to train her so that she would make the association between getting the drops and getting treats, but I took it a step further by allowing her a choice. So rather than just scooping her up and you know popping the stuff in her eye, I give her a minute to kind of get ready. So it's almost like she's hitting the start button. So she obviously recognizes the bottles at this point. I'll kneel down and I'll say, okay, are you ready? And she'll, she'll do a couple turns. It's almost like she's getting her courage up, like, okay, I can do this, I can do this. And when she's ready, she'll come up to me and I'll put the drops in. So just allowing her this little choice is so powerful and it really transforms a part of, of her daily life right now that she's not a huge fan, in, fan of, but she feels like she has more of a say in what's happening. Touch. Now we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this again in a little bit, but our dog should have the, the opportunity to say no thank you to touch, whether it's from us or from strangers. And again, being your dog's advocate is a way that, you know, if you see someone coming on too strong with your dog, it happens, right? You can say, okay, well, we're gonna, we're gonna keep going, thanks, bye, and move on. Helping your dog have a choice in the scenario. Sniffing, this is huge. So when we walk our dogs, we are more interested in going from point A to point B. And that's not how it is for our dogs. They need that enrichment. They want to read the P-mail. So depriving your dog of that opportunity is, is depriving him some enrichment, but also it's, it's just an important part of his life. So Sniffing, dogs need at least four to five seconds to translate a scent, but the average pet parent only gives about two seconds before they move them on. Allowing your dog the opportunity to just stop and literally smell the roses or the poles, as it probably is more likely, is a really beautiful and easy choice. And this is for my small dog people getting picked up. Now I have two smaller dogs. Um, neither one enjoys getting picked up and they, they do have a choice. I will say, may I? Like if I have to pick them up, I will say, may I pick you up? And if she stands and waits, we're good to go. You can train your dog to feel more comfortable getting picked up. But the scenarios where a dog is constantly being picked up, like if you have to chase your dog to pick your dog up, then there's probably something that needs to be looked at in that relationship. And just a quick sidebar story. Um, some, a, a client asked me to come help them with their dog before going out for a walk. And, you know, they said, oh, she's, she's hard to leash up. Okay, easy problem. So I get to their house and it's a case of the dog just tearing through the house and they're trying to attach the leash and the little dog is like, please, no. 
when we got deeper into the issue, we realized that they were picking this dog up so much and she had just had it. So we, we revisited the way that they interacted with their dog. But again, that ability to control outcomes is so important for mental health and giving your dog the opportunity to make these types of choices is a really simple way to, to improve your bond. Let's move on to the fun stuff. This is why we're here, how to build your bond. Oh, you hear the sirens, guys? Our neighbors were doing um, drum practice as well. So it was just like everything's happening at once. Okay, how to build your bond. Use what you learned in training school. For some reason, we think that a lot of us think that training is party tricks, cute little things that our dog can do, like sit before we give a biscuit or a stay before we put down our food bowl. But it's more than just party tricks. The reason you train is to give you a common language and a way to communicate with each other. And, you know, the whole reason is to use these skills in real life. Use them what, use what you've learned every day. Um, it decreases frustration. And that's a big part of when the bond is in jeopardy, it's because there's frustration happening. So I have a, a great example. I was going to tell you a different story, but I swear to you just this week, this happened within my household. And I said, oh, this is exactly what I'm talking about in action. So my husband was loading up the dishwasher because we have an equal division of labor in our house. And my dog, Olive, again, the squeaky wheel, was getting into the dishwasher. And I didn't actually see this happening. He told me later, he's like, oh, it was so frustrating. She kept trying to get in and her paws were in the way. And I said, honey, did you think about putting her in her spot? So we, I, we've taught our dogs when we're prepping in the kitchen that they need to go hang out on this, this little rug nearby. They can see all the action, but they're not underfoot. So when I mentioned sending the dogs to the spot, it was like this light bulb went off over his head like, oh yeah, that's exactly why we've trained them to do it. And then the next night, what did he do? Sent Olive to her spot. She watched from a distance like a good little girl. And at the end, she got her treat. So training is fun. At least positive reinforcement training is fun for dogs and for people. So keep on doing it. Keep on training. Use what you learn as much as you can in your daily life. Uh, it's, it's such a fun part of life with dogs. All right, so this is confusing, isn't, isn't it? Be predictably unpredictable. Now dogs thrive on predictability. They like to know what's gonna happen next, right? And they're very good at knowing what comes next. They're excellent timekeepers, especially around walks and mealtimes, but my belief is that if we can add a little bit of unpredictability into their lives, your bond is gonna be stronger. And look, I follow my own advice. Bam, it's a kitty. We're not all just dogs all the time. So I was predictably unpredictable for you. So doing this keeps life interesting. So let's talk about a few ways you can introduce some safe unpredictability into your dog's world. Walks. I don't know about you, but I tend to fall into the same patterns and I have to stop myself from taking the same walk every day. You can introduce a new direction. Even if you're, you, know, you, you don't have the option of doing a crazy different walk, reverse it. Or um, you know, if you can, obviously go a different route every day. Time of day when you walk, this is huge. Again, dogs are such good timekeepers when four o'clock rolls around or whatever time you choose, God knows now with, you know, the way life is, but dogs are like, okay, let's go. Can we please walk? Being predictably unpredictable means you're going to walk at different times. So you're not going to have that expectant dog who's, you know, giving you nose punches on the leg saying, let's go, let's go, let's go. So walk one day at nine and one day at one, just so your dog never knows what's going to happen next in the best possible way. Treats. This is another super simple way to introduce some really cool unpredictability into your dog's world. 
I think we fall into the trap of saying, oh, my dog loves peanut butter toasty oats. So that's what I'm going to buy for him. And sure he does, but there are so many other options and you know, there should be a hierarchy of treats in our household. That's what we have, depending on what we're doing, we get different treats. So we have a cookie jar that just has our basic, you know, they're good biscuits, but they're not the best. And then in the cupboard, we have all the good stuff, the freeze dried liver, the greasy salmon things that smell absolutely disgusting, all of that good stuff. And the hierarchy applies to what are they doing to, to earn that treat? So for example, if they're in the back corner of our yard, barking at our neighbor and they come running back when I call them, what are they gonna get? Heck yes, they're getting freeze dried liver. They're getting something where they're like, thank goodness, I love it. So rather than using the same treat for everything, introduce new treats, hierarchy of treat based on the need or based on the activity. And finally, games. And we will talk about games more because they're super important. I love that you play games with your dog, but let's try and change it up a little bit. So you've got a dog that loves to fetch, um, loves tennis balls. How about buying those squeaky tennis balls instead of using real tennis balls? Or better yet, go to the pet store and buy half a dozen different balls. And when you're playing fetch, each time you throw that ball, throw something different. Awesome unpredictability. And that's our last cat. But look how gorgeous this guy is. Okay, speak your appreciation sounds very fancy. But it's just a way of saying, praise your dog. I don't know why we are reluctant to praise. It's so easy. You always have your praiser with you and dogs appreciate it. First though, you have to learn how, what your dog appreciates. Um, I, I always remember in, in training when we're doing the recall, I always say, you know, when your dog gets back to you, praise him, let him know how smart he is. And people will go, oh, fight, oh, good boy. And they'll smack their dog on the head. And the dog's like, oh, no thanks, no thanks. So that's not the best type of praise for that particular dog. You want to you wanna make sure whether it's physical or verbal, which is more what I'm talking about here, the pitch, the volume. For some dogs, if you do the, oh my gosh, good, 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 it's going to get them all ratcheted up. So going back to doglish again and understanding what your dog is saying to you, Praise, watch how your dog reacts and catalog it. And then what? Well, then once you figured out exactly the right way to praise your dog, use it during walks. I swear to you, my neighbors must think I am insane because I talk to my dog so much during walks and I say thank you to them all the time. Do, I hope you guys say thank you to your dogs. Um, but, you know, just walking along beside me, if we have a beautiful stretch of them, I do have two dogs, by the way, <laughs> them walking along beside me, I will look down at them and say, you are so good. You look so good. Simple. Remember, the behavior that is rewarded will be repeated and praising is a type of reward. So when else can you praise? Potty behavior. Your dog is going to do it anyway. Why not acknowledge it? Why not say, hey, good job. Nice work. Excellent graffiti on that post. During the recall approach, this is huge. You know, I mentioned you know, not smacking the dog on the head when he gets right up to you, but as he's coming across the field, if you've trained a beautiful recall, and I hope you have, as your dog is running, the worst thing you can do is just stand there and be like, mm hmm, okay. I think you should be going, yay, awesome, fantastic, you are doing such a great job. That's gonna make your dog run even faster back to you. So always on the recall approach, everyday responsiveness, anything your dog does, even if it's just like you drop a piece of cucumber on the ground and you say, wait, and he doesn't lunge for it, praise it. Um, and this is for my puppy people, um, stopping naughty behavior. Naughty is in quotes because it implies the dog knows better. That's not always the case, guys. So anytime your dog is doing something that you would like it to stop, and again, puppies are a great example. Let's say your puppy is digging in the potted plant and you say, Fido, uh -uh, and Fido backs off, praise it. It feels counterintuitive because I'm sure you're thinking, well, he shouldn't have been doing that in the first place. 
No, but that's on you because you didn't potty uh, puppy proof. But he listened. Your dog actually, when you said, please don't, your dog said, okay, I won't. Praise. And it's just such a simple way to acknowledge your dog's good behavior. Obviously, I'm a big fan of praise. So I mentioned touch. Touch is huge. If you were to see me when I meet a new dog, you might assume, if you didn't know me, you might assume that maybe I don't like dogs or maybe I had a bad experience because I'm not effusive. I'm not one of these people that's like, oh my gosh, I love your dog. What I'll do is watch the dog, again, doglish, and I'll do something called the pet test. So if the dog is close enough to me and it looks like maybe it wants to interact, I'll give a little pet, little scratch on the chest, three to five seconds, and then I stop because I need to make sure that that dog is interested in interacting with me, is interested in my, my physical contact. So one of two things will happen. Either the dog will say, oh my God, please more. And I'll get like the paw on the hand or they'll come up and bump or they'll say, nope, no thank you. And how do they show that? Again, doglish. If a dog just stands there, that's not a yes to me. That's not a dog saying, please give me more. If the dog um, looks away or walks away, same thing. That's a dog who's not interested in more touch. And again, this isn't just dogs that you meet. You should definitely you know, ask the dog, can I touch you in this way? But even our own dogs, petting is contextual and it's situational. So yeah, your, your lab might absolutely love all the physical affection, but what if you're at the vet? And he's really stressed out and he's in the waiting room and he's trembling and you touch him and he's like, oh no. Or at the dog park and he's having a really rowdy, awesome time with his buddies and you go to touch him. He's like, no mom, that's not cool. So the point I'm trying to make is acknowledging and recognizing when your dog is saying, yes, please more or no thanks, I'm good for now. We have to honor what our dogs tell us. And this is, is it's really close to home for me because my former dog, my Boston Terrier, did not like petting for the longest time. And once again, Olive, my squeaky wheel, for seven years, did not like petting. And it was a slow burn for her to start saying, okay, maybe it's not so bad. I had to hold off from physical affection because she told me very clearly, no, thank you. And happy ending. Now she will occasionally solicit petting and just, you know, here, this, she likes ears and she likes top of the head. And I do my best to honor that. All right, play. So I know you guys are playing with your dogs and I love you for it, but let's change it up. If we want to build that bond, we need to keep surprising our dog and doing things in a different way. So, oh, oh, I do have my, my visual aid, good, good. So I love games that ask our dog to tap into their sense of smell because it is so incredible. And, and putting it to use in games, not only is really amazing to watch just as a spectator, it wears them out because it's tapping into their brain in a different way. And this is the mental enrichment that I was talking about at the beginning of the presentation. So these are two games that I really love, hide the toy, simple to teach. You, if your dog has a stay, you put your dog in a stay. You take a toy, hopefully something they really love. You can even invest in something new. Hide it in plain sight. Oh, and by the way, if your dog doesn't have a good stay, just have a family member hold him. Hide it in plain sight so he can see it and then say, find it. Let your dog go. He's going to go grab it. You have a couple minutes of play together and then repeat the process over and over until your dog over and over, maybe six times, 10 times until your dog starts to understand that, excuse me for one second. We're having a little doggy drama upstairs. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, until your dog starts to recognize that find it means you need to go look for that hidden toy. This is where it gets interesting. I mean, this, this initial step is cool, but it gets better. Once your dog recognizes find it means go look for the toy, take him out of the room, hide the toy in a spot where you've hidden it before, and then open the door and let your dog come back in and say, find it, holy moly. So he's got to use just his sense of smell to find that hidden toy. It is fascinating. You're going to see exactly how that nose works. 
And again, it's going to wear your dog out. Oh, another reason I love um, hiding games too is because any dogs of any age can play. You can do it with a puppy. You can do it with a senior. You don't need a lot of space. You just have to be creative. Um, you can do it inside or outside. I will play hide the toy with, with Millie, my other dog, my non-squeaky wheel, um, outside in the yard. And she's just running from shrub to shrub trying to find it. It's incredible. And, it, you know, it's, it's just a really awesome way to improve your relationship. The hide and seek is similar to hide the toy, but instead of hiding a toy, you're hiding yourself. And this is great because it's a foundation behavior for coming when calls, you know, your dog is coming to find you. And this is simple to teach as well. Same thing, either put your dog in a stay or uh, have someone hold him, you go hide and then you just say, come find me. And you let your dog try and find wherever you are. Now, initial steps, you might have to give your dog some hints. You might have to do, I'll do like a, pss, pss, pss. like if I'm in a really hard spot, I will give hints, but don't rely on hints too much because then, then they don't use their nose. Uh, and then my final favorite game, and yes, I play these games with my dogs. I love them all, toy on a string. So if you follow me on any social media, you will know that I talk about toy on a string constantly. So this is one of my favorite ways to play with dogs. I call it the lazy person's game because you really don't have to do much, but your dog is going to be running like a nutcase. So you take a toy, you know, small that's appropriate for your size dog. Smaller is a little bit better because you want it to be kind of aerodynamic. Attach it to a string. I like to use an elastic string because I think it's easier on my dog's mouth if they happen to, to grab this part. This is called shot cord and you can get this anywhere online. And then you start pulling it around along the ground like a cat toy. It is very, very similar to the way cats play. But if you think about it, dogs love to chase rapidly retreating objects. You know, they love to chase squirrels, right? Why wouldn't they love chasing toy on a string? So when you first start introducing this, you have to keep it kind of slow and low. Some dogs are like, I'm not sure about this. Some dogs get it right away but make it easy on them. Just drag it slowly along until they start getting interested. And then you can start moving it more quickly. And then once they're really good at it, you start whipping it around. Now, not like this though, definitely not up in the air. You don't want to encourage jumping. I'm sure we all have jumpy dogs. We don't want to encourage that behavior. So always keep the toy on the ground. Um, a few caveats and cautionary tales, things might break. I broke a lamp playing this game with my dog. <laughs> we were, they were up on the bed and they let go and it whipped across the room and knocked my, my bed stand lamp off and broke it. And also sometimes you might get hurt. My dogs never get hurt playing this game, but the string will come off. I've gotten it in the face. I've gotten it on the hand. I have a little hand injury. So those are the two cautionary tales for doing toy on a string. I cannot say enough about these games and what they can do for your dog's mental health, enrichment, and your relationship because there's nothing quite like having fun with your dog. And that really is the core core of, of building your bond. Sometimes it's hard to remember, you know, if you're dealing with a potty training puppy or you've got a, a more you know, entrenched behavior like leash reactivity. Sometimes it's easy to forget about the fun, but if we can have little moments, you know, find these beautiful moments of playing together, you are gonna build your bond and your relationship is gonna be that much happier for it. So in conclusion, guys, this is where you can find me. Uh, the two left books are the training books. The three to the right are fiction. If you look below them, can you, I think you can see my mouse. Um, I am very active on Instagram. I am a crazy dog mom. I do have lots of photo shoots with my dog. So you can see my squeaky wheel in action as well as Millie, who's my golden child. Uh, Facebook and Twitter as well. I'm not quite as active there, but I'll leave this up just for a couple minutes. And now I cannot believe I'm right on time, guys. And this will be recorded. So if you want to get that information, you can. Now it's time for questions. So 
I would love to hear what you guys think about the bond or any challenges that you're facing or questions you have. Well, thank you so much. This was lots of great information and we have um, really great questions to address as well. Um, I also just wanted to ask you quickly just about Puppy Bowl, um, because I know that's oh, yeah. probably the dream job for many of us. Just um, Victoria has been the trainer on Puppy Bowl for 15 years. So maybe just talk for a, a minute about that or just what that's like with a whole room full of puppies and yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. It's my favorite time of the year. Spoiler alert, guys, it happens in October. It's not live. A lot of people don't realize that. So this year was different, obviously, because of the pandemic. And a lot of us wondered, were we going to be able to do it? Yes, we did. And let me tell you, this year was incredible. Even with all of the restrictions we had, um, typically, though, Puppy Bowl is so much more than what you see on the field. It's a week's worth, more than a week. Of, of recording of you know behind the scenes footage and all of the play that you see on the field. We film the kitten halftime show. So not only am I handling the puppies, I'm also handling the kittens. And just a little tip when you watch this year and you see any directed activity. So if you see like a kitty reaching up above the camera or towards the camera, nine times out of 10, I'm standing right next to the camera with a little feather wand going, hey, kitty, kitty. Or when you see the dogs looking up at the flag during the Star Spangled Banner, I'm standing right next to the cameraman with a little treat going, oh, don't you want this? So yeah, and then my the other part of my job is just making sure that everything that's happening on the field is safe, constructive, happy puppy play. And it's my favorite time of the year. Oh, thank you, that, that's great. Um, okay, let me get to the questions. Um, First, um, just because this is what was the beginning of your presentation is about collars, because we have um, one question about Martingale collars. She has a pity or is getting another pity soon. Um, and with that, we'll also ask about uh, citronella bark collars. So are those okay. also in the no, no, you know? So Martingale, it depends on your, your goal for the collar. So if you've got a pibble that's a puller, uh, it's not your best solution. There are so many great no pull harnesses that will work better. And again, I'm making assumptions here because I don't have the whole picture. But uh, no, Martingale isn't isn't on the no no list. Thank you for asking. And Citronella collar, yeah, kind of. Um, we need to look at the reason why the dog is barking. There's, you know, people will say, "Well, my dog barks. What do I do?" Is he barking at the delivery guy? Is he barking at you for attention? Is he barking at the neighbor dog? So it's very contextual, but a bark collar, any, any type of equipment that you put on a dog that uses punishment to suppress behavior isn't a good idea. So there's, there's always another way to work through a problem. Great. Um, and then I'd love for you to talk a little bit. We have several questions about this, and I know this is on everyone's mind, is um, with the COVID lockdown, everyone's worried, is my dog too bonded to me? What can mm. I do now to prepare for later? And yeah, so a little bit about that would be very yes. helpful. Yes, I love that question. It is very, very important and very real. Um, yeah, your dog can definitely be too bonded to you given the way we've been living for the past forever, it feels like. Um, and what you can do is start mimicking your schedule as much as you can. Leave the house, you know. It's tempting to want to bring your dog everywhere you go, but set up a time where you leave for an hour. Do what you normally would do. If, if you crate your dog, put him in the crate with a Kong or something to do, or if you put him in a special room, but you need to start to ease your way back into um, the routines that you had prior to lockdown. And what about for puppies who have only ever lived in this, you know, with you? So same, right? But just... It's going to be really interesting seeing, uh, seeing how COVID puppies grow up. But yeah, and, and even, I mean, even before COVID, it's so important to help puppies learn to be comfortable alone, you know, preferably in a crate that's sized appropriately for the dog and not for too long either. But yeah, same, same drill. They need to get used to being alone. And maybe small amounts of time at first and then gradually. Yes. Up. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's what that, yeah. For, you know, for 
Well, it depends. I mean, one would assume that the puppy's been created for, for short periods of time. And yeah, and then you would move up to longer and longer. But again, the rule of thumb is the number of months old your puppy is, is roughly how long she can hold it in the crate. But I always say go for a little bit shorter um, rather than the full month to hour comparison. Great. Okay. Um, and then just, I guess, with our other, with our dogs, the older dogs, um, the same sort of just get them used to, even if you're not going back to work now, leave for a few, make, be sure to leave for a few minutes for the day, well, gradually work out, right? Yeah. yeah, more than a few minutes. I mean, the yeah. assumption is your dog at some point was used to you going to work. Yeah. So just try and establish your routine, you know, the similar to what you were doing before, get in the car, you know, pick up your car keys, put on your jacket, put your dog where you normally would put him and head out. Great, great. Okay, good. I'm trying to do that definitely with- Yeah, you. it's hard. And, and you know, I think a lot of what I'm hearing as well is that we're worried about how we're going to feel, you know, separation anxiety from being apart from our dog. So it's both of us, you know, are, are definitely. dealing with that. So, yep. but yeah. Um, you know, it's been great having the time together, but it is, it does bring challenges. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, some good questions too, about the need for sniffing. Um, if your dog has scavengering tendencies, especially in the city, um, how do you deal with that? Yeah. When I started my training career, I did a lot of work in DC with clients and never realized how many chicken bones were on the street till I started walking dogs in DC. Um, how you deal with that, you want to teach a really strong leave it and drop it, which are two separate things. So the leave it is, we both see it, you're going for it, please don't. And then drop it is, oh, I didn't catch you in time. You got it in your mouth, please let go of it. So those are, you know, the preempt is really the preference because especially if you're dealing with a high value item, it gets a little dicier unless you've done a lot, lot, lot of training to get that fluent. But yeah, leave it is beautiful. And always anything you're training, reward that. So if the dog says, oh yeah, you're right. I'm going to come back to you. Always a treat. We should always be walking with treats in our pocket. My dog is 10 years old. Every time I walk my dog, I have treats for her. Um, we have a question too about treats. So in terms of unpredictability with treats, should, should you mix it up for a given task or cue or a certain prompt? Always give a different type level of treat. I would say, I would say the levels apply to what you're doing with the dog. So, like I said, just around the house stuff, you know, if they go to their spot while I'm cooking, I'll give them the basic treat. But when it's something more intense or more challenging, you, you level up, you amp up the type of treat you're giving. Um, with what my one dog, uh, the squeaky wheel, <laughs> I really do love her very much. She has some leash reactivity and I'll have two pockets. One pocket is just the, you're doing a nice job and here's an occasional treat. And one is the, oh, there's a dog and let's work on reactivity and you watching me. And she gets rewarded with the special treats, the extra special treats when we're doing that. So even within the context of a walk, I'm putting a hierarchy to what I'm giving. Great. great. That makes sense? I think so. Yeah, <laughs> it does to me. Okay, good. Um, yeah. Um, okay, can you be too affectionate with your dog or too permissive? Yes. Okay. Well, respect. Yes. you can be too affectionate if your dog is not appreciating the affection. Now, I'm not one of these people that's like, ooh, don't spoil your dog. Define spoiling. Letting your dog sit on the couch next to you is not spoiling. Um, the too much is in regards to a dog that is saying no thank you to your affections. But if your dog is eating it up and you're having a mutual love fest, great, go for it. Great, good. Um, we have some questions too about um, leash aggressive or reactive dogs. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's not an easy fix to, to do that. So maybe it's um, some information about choosing a, a trainer if you have advice for that. Um, yeah, definitely. I have advice for um, the trainer and I also have great empathy for those of us that are dealing with leash reactive dogs. I had a leash reactive boxer who taught me, like I said, empathy, humility, um, the challenges of it. It is hard. It is really hard. And I feel for you. And I feel like when I was, you know, training full time, 
I was in my client's shoes when they were dealing with it. It's you're the talk of the neighborhood in the worst possible way. So I get it. Um, it's all about treats. That's the shorthand. It is a tough question to answer in this context, but it is all about maintaining a buffer of distance from the stimulus or the trigger and rewarding and making a positive association between the scary thing and good things, which is treats. As far as finding a trainer, um, there are some really great resources. The Association of Pet Dog Trainers has a trainer search. However, they do not vet very strictly to find out the methodologies that are used. So um, you can do some recon when you're looking up trainers if they mention anything about being balanced. More than likely, this is a trainer that's employing some of the older methods um, or doing both. You know, we're doing clicker and we're using a choke chain on your dog. Um, so I'm all over the place now, guys. Uh, the Association of Pet Dog Trainers, Karen Pryor, is uh, the, the grandmother of clicker training. She has a lot of um, clicker trainers listed on her website. I always trained with clicker. I love it. I didn't mention it in the presentation, but it's fabulous. Uh, I know I'm forgetting resources, but really look carefully at, at the description of how they work with dogs. Anything that seems vague, question, you know, it's all about, well, here I am talking about relationship, but you know, if they say it's about relationship and maintaining balance, I'd be a little concerned about that. The trainers that in their bio or in their description say, you know, these are, I, I admire these specific people and this is the type of things that we'll be doing. You want as much information as you can get from the trainer, even prior to reaching out to them. But I, I'm kicking myself for forgetting some of the other resources, but Karen Pryor, oh, uh, Victoria Stillwell also has a trainer search. We can um, put that together and we'll send that out to everyone mm -hmm. tomorrow, some, uh, some links <clears throat> that you recommend. So that, that's great. A um, couple more. Um, how do you manage the bond with a younger pup when your older dog requires so much attention? Or just basically for both, yeah. Getting yeah, that, that's a tough one. Yeah, I think it's super important to continue to keep your older dog's lifestyle as close to what it was pre-puppy as you can, even though it's really tempting to, you know, pay so much more attention to your puppy because he has greater needs. You really have to take time, separate time for your older dog. Um, time away from the puppy is super important. And, you know, applying some of the things we talked about tonight, but doing it separately instead of, you know, joint training, it's great to do joint training, but maybe setting aside time to work with just your senior for a while and then give him something to do, give him a bone or a Kong and then go work with your puppy. But maintaining the balance of life pre-puppy is super important. Great, great. Um, we have one, a question about tips for games um, for those of us with blind dogs. Um, ah. 14 years old, still loves to play, but it's challenging to find games um, beyond giving toys to chew on. We also have a question about deaf dogs. So maybe okay. special so needs pets, yeah. Let's tackle blind dog first. Um, the scenting games, find the toy would be amazing. So, you know, get a special toy, a special squeaky toy. Maybe that toy can live in um, some treats or something that to, to get it a little more scented and put it somewhere close by. You know, hiding is pretty simple <laughs> for, a, for a blind dog. But yeah, I'm just kind of thinking through it as we talk about it. I think the scent-based games are probably your best bet. You could also do, um, there's DIY puzzle toys. You can invest in puzzle toys, but you can also make your own where you take a muffin tin and get um, tennis balls, and then you put treats under some of the tennis balls and you, you know, put them all in the muffin tin, and then your dog has to nuzzle through to find those treats in the tin. And then the, the, what was the specific question with the deaf dog? Um, I'm not, let me find that one. Um, here, I, I'm going to look for that one, but let me give you this one in the meantime. Um, we have a lot about nervousness with yeah. noises. Um, okay. you know, not for the deaf dog, but just let me find that. Yeah, scared of construction or, or noises, skateboards, that type of thing. Several about oh. that. Yeah, so it can, I mean, if we're talking about in the house, you can muffle. Um, white noise machines are super, super helpful. If we're talking about out on the street, 
if you see it coming and you have no choice but to pass, so you want to do as much of a buffer as you can and, you know, treats, 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 treats. I am, I did not talk enough about the importance of treats when we're training, but if you're far enough away, your dog will probably still be able to take those treats. Um, skateboarders, that's, that's a combination. That's not just the sound. It's also the movement. It's pretty jarring. I mean, even I can get frightened by them. So again, buffer of distance, the buffer of distance is always your friend because it allows your dog to collect himself and be able to process. Once you get too close, you tip over into fight or flight and your dog's not going to probably not going to be able to eat treats and is going to be too stressed out to really respond to anything. So I keep going back to distance, but distance is your friend. Anytime you're working with fear, aggression, or reactivity during the initial phases, it changes. It's not distance for life. It's just as you're getting over the initial hump. Right. Um, and then about the deaf dog, it's a very old Maltese um, who has mobility problems, a deaf dog who has mobility problems. What's the best exercise for him? Oh, mobility problems. I would say swimming. <laughs> um, hmm, this could be a stumper tonight, guys. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm. Wait, he, you see, this is the deaf guy with mobility issues? Yeah, yeah, and very old Maltese. So, in All order right. to exercise him, to get him, you know. I think toy on a string, really low key could be a good option. And I am also pro tug. Uh, I love tug. I know that there's outdated information, you know, oh, it's going to make your dog aggressive. It will not make your dog aggressive. Um, that's the old school way of thinking. Tug is great. If you play with rules, your dog drops when you ask, will take it when you give it. And you take frequent breaks as you play to do, you know, just a quick sit or a quick down. But um, so tug with the, with the older pup or toy on a string. It doesn't have to be non-stop insanity you can pull it along nice and slowly and uh, your dog will enjoy playing that way okay great okay so this is a challenging one so um my puppy what other incentives other than treats uh, my puppy is now just looking for treats that she's not very willing to do the behavior if she recognizes that a treat may not be given so well, if we're still talking about a puppy, there's no reason to wean off of treats quite yet. So um, this, again, this is kind of related to our inability or our unwillingness to praise. I think as long as you're still in the hardcore training phase, you should be using treats as much as you can. Now you can intersperse. Oh, here comes my dogs. Just in time. You want to see them? Yeah. <laughs> They're really cute. Oh. So this is Millie. This is the non-squeaky wheel. This is my 10-year-old smooth, smooth Brussels Griffon. I'm guessing everyone needs to go outside for a quick potty break. Um, oh, so treats. Yes. So treats as uh, I think you, weaning is a slow process. It's going to happen down the road. But at this point, keep treating as much as you can and then introduce your, your basic cues with real life. It's called a, a say please program. So before you put your dog's food bowl down, ask him or her to sit. Before you open the door, ask for a sit. It's just a nice way to get some manners. Um, and you don't have to give a treat. It's another way of rewarding your dog. Or when you're playing, if you have a dog that enjoys fetch before you throw the ball, ask for a sit or a down. Incorporating these cues into your everyday life will help. But again, don't be too quick to try and get rid of those treats. Really think about why do you want to get rid of treats? Because I like to get a paycheck. Your dog likes to get a paycheck. So yeah, I, I understand not every single response needs a treat, but when you've got a young dog, you really want to encourage yeah, good behavior with, uh, reward good behavior, I guess. Great, great. Um, and then this is kind of related uh, and how do you distinguish or indicate to a puppy that they're on a training walk versus a walk that's for sniffing slower or faster? Is it necessary to do that? Yeah. How do you there, every walk is a training walk. Every time you leash up your dog, they're learning. Every interaction you have with your dog, they are learning. So there is no difference. I would just say um, if it's a concern about pulling or manners, I mean, that's, that should be standard every time you go out as well. But as you walk, you know, during the interludes where they're not sniffing, 
you're rewarding for that nice leash walking behavior. Um, and then you take little breaks to sniff. Now I will say I'm so pro sniffing. However, I recognize if we're in a hurry, sometimes you can't stop and smell the roses. So I like to do uh, something. Uh, I do a one, two, three, which I let my dog know that, okay, we're going to be moving on pretty soon. So get your last, last sniffs in. So as Millie specifically, when she's sniffing, I'll say, okay, one, two. And she's like, oh, we're going to be moving soon. Three. And then she's like, okay, I'm ready to go. So it's a, a nice way of saying, I'm going to, I'm ready to walk on. Are you ready? And I don't do this every time she sniffs, but if there's a spot where she, I'm just like, okay, dude, it's been a while. Let's move on. I'll do the one, two, three. I don't know if that answered the question or not. No, that's very good. That's very good. Um, uh, and then the last, I just would love to ask a little more about rescue dogs is just sort of how learning to trust them, obviously when their history is sort of a mystery can be a challenge. I know you've done a lot of work with some amazing rescue dogs. Um, so just basically, I, I know that's obviously like a big question, but mm -hmm. just how do you get to read them if you get a dog that you don't know their background or, you know, what's the best way? Go slow, I guess, but just, I, yeah. Go slowly and I think um, don't make assumptions. I think it's really easy to, you know, say, oh, this dog was abused because of X, Y, Z. We're so quick to say that there was abuse when in fact it probably is a case of a dog not being socialized or not having exposure. You know, maybe it was living in a backyard or was in the country and now it's in the city. So um, don't make assumptions about the background and don't make assumptions about what they know or don't know. Anytime an adult dog comes into my house I will just pretend like they're an eight week old puppy. So the house is puppy proofed. We are going out for potty trips all the time. They're being rewarded for pottying outside. For pottying outside. Um, they get a treat for going outside. They're never unsupervised. So that's another way not to make an assumption. Even though you think like, well, he's an adult dog, he should, we don't know that. So rather than set the dog up to fail, I'll just say this is this is a brand new puppy and we're we're learning everything from scratch. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Victoria. This was amazing. So much great information. And as I mentioned, everyone, we're going to send out the link tomorrow and some resources. And again, we are so grateful for you all for spending your evening, part of your evening with us. I know this is a difficult time and um, just we really appreciate it. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. I'm gonna...